Hello, I'm Anne McElvoy. Welcome to BBC Radio 3's Arts and Ideas discussion programme, bringing together leading artists, writers and thinkers in conversation and debate. If you enjoy what you hear, do subscribe. Search for the Arts and Ideas podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please do rate and review us. It'll help other people to find us. This is the BBC. Hello. The opening bars of Beethoven's Third Symphony, a work that the composer originally dedicated to Napoleon. He saw him as an embodiment of the democratic ideals of the French Revolution, only to revise both his opinion and the dedication when Bonaparte declared himself emperor in 1804. Nearly 200 years after his death, Napoleon remains a figure who captures the popular imagination. He's been portrayed as both a hero and a villain in history books, in popular songs, plays, films and caricatures. Over the next 45 minutes, my guests and I will hold many of these representations up to the light. We want to discern what they can tell us about Bonaparte himself and the ways in which he's been reimagined by different generations. I'm joined by the historians Michael Broers, Laura O'Brien and Oscar Cox Jensen, the journalist Nabila Ramdani and theatre director Catherine Hunter. Welcome to you all and I would like to begin, if I could, by getting a snapshot of the different, perhaps contradictory aspects of Napoleon. So could I ask you to suggest three words that describe Bonaparte as you see him? Laura? I'm going to start with iconic, legendary and mediated. Oh, interesting. We're going to dig into that one later. Uh, Oscar. OK, I'm going to go with a rather annoying word, harlequin, which will make sense at the time. Everyman, which I think you can all get hold of, mm. and a particular word from 1803, bugaboo. Bugaboo, <laughs> right. The most interesting word so far, but Michael Bros, it's your turn. I'm going to use his own last words. Army, France, Josephine. Nabila. I think I'm going to go with the more objective uh, views about him, which is soldier, imperialist and leader. Catherine Hunter. This is the Napoleon via the death of Napoleon by Simon Lees. So my three words are insane, hilarious and human. Michael Broers is Professor of Western European History at Oxford University and March sees the publication of his second volume of biography of Napoleon. It takes us from the build-up to Austerlitz in 1805 through to 1810. These are key, action-packed five years in the life of Napoleon, Michael. Give us a quick overview of what happens. Oh, well, he conquers Europe. Uh, from 1805, the War of the Third Coalition begins against um, Austria and Russia with Britain in the background, and he wins that. And in 1806, the Prussians take the field against him and he defeats them. And then in 1807, he and the Russians fight themselves to a draw. They divide up Europe. Uh, in 1808, he invades Spain, which doesn't go quite so well. In 1809, he fights the Austrians again and defeats them. But along the way, um, he tries to reorder Europe um, for good and bad, for modern purposes and uh, in his own cynical way. Uh, and above all, I think from a personal point of view, his family disintegrates. He loses his relationship with most of his brothers. Uh, he has to divorce the woman he loves and he remarries. And that's why I end it when I do with his divorce and remarriage, because it's a biography of a human being after all. We all know that Waterloo is, is the great defeat of Napoleon, but do you share the view that Austerlitz is the high watermark of his military successes, at least? I think you have to share that with the following campaign in 1806 against Prussia. But um, I think Austerlitz is because it takes the world by such a surprise. He was faced with superior numbers. He was a long way from base. Um, and it's his army. I think this is the most interesting thing. His army that he had built up, trained, honed in the channel camps was a weapon of mass destruction that nobody knew about. 
everybody underrated it. And at Austerlitz, he proved exactly how good both he and his men were. What do you think the misunderstandings are about Napoleon, particularly perhaps from a British point of view? I think there's a misperception that he was trying to recreate the old French monarchy. He was not. He was trying to do something very new. It was authoritarian, but it was very new. Like he insists on being an emperor, not a king. Uh, and that's as much to do with putting distance between himself and the past as puffing himself up. I think there's a great misunderstanding of him among many people because it's only now with the marvellous new edition of the Correspondence Générale that the Fondation Napoleon is bringing out, which is really why I took this project on, that you can see him as a very rational person most of the time. You can see him as someone who really can't apologise to but he was wrong, and as a remarkably forgiving person of everyone except his brothers. Well, let's come on to the family because that's obviously something that you know, yeah, I can mm. sense that you've wanted to foreground in in the next volume of your writing about him. How significant is the sundering of family ties and what drives it and why? I mean, it's it's deeply sad, but why is it so important to him? This is a perception of Napoleon that people sometimes get right and wrong. He says this himself, that the, the regime, the creation of the empire, it's a family undertaking. It's not necessarily done for the family, but it's done by the family. We all have our part to play. And I think particularly by the time he gets to 1809. And 1809 is a traumatic moment for him. That victory over Austria was hard won. He lost a lot of close friends. He lost a lot of his best men. And he feels incredibly... I don't think the only word I can find is let down by his brothers. Because why? Well, Joseph, who he'd made first king of Naples and then in 1808 king of Spain, is his older brother... He was the person to whom Napoleon was probably closest in the whole world. And he feels that Joseph has let himself down in Spain. He's been cowardly. He keeps running, <clears throat> trying to run away and Napoleon has to stop him. And it's interesting to watch the correspondence that while there's a crisis on, Napoleon's trying to G him up. You don't kick a man when he's down. He shows amazing leadership skills. And Joseph lets him down on the one hand by being so over-the-top optimistic and then slipping into depression. He feels he's let him down. His next brother has been alienated for a long time, um, Lucien. But Louis, he brought Louis up. You've got to remember that, that Napoleon brought up his younger siblings. His mm. father was dead, died when he was a teenager, and he took it upon himself to bring them up. And Louis, he tried to mould. This is the, the obsessive bad side of him. He sees Louis as a clone. But Louis is a human being. And to Napoleon, Louis has failed him as king of Holland. Because he isn't like him. Well, because he can't, he feels that he annoys the Dutch, he's indecisive, he's weak. He plays at being a soldier, but he's not a soldier. And in the end, when people talk about Napoleon placing his families on thrones, this English perception you know, of the dark mm. myth, you've got to remember, he pulls Louis into his office in Paris and just like Alan Sugar points the finger at him and says, you're fired, he deposes Louis. Hmm. And Louis is so scared that Napoleon's taken a contract in him. He goes and hides in Czechoslovakia, what's now the Czech Republic. So it's, it's a like, very traumatic moment. The image of, of Boney, this, this, the military commander, but, you know, both lionised, but feared, certainly, but also mocked. Did he sort of caught this image of standing out from any other leader or any other military commander in European history? Yes, but not in the way you'd think. Now, people, there are other people who know a great deal more about art and art history than, than I do. But take a look at any painting of Napoleon as a field commander. All the other marshals are decked out like Christmas trees. Napoleon himself is wearing his cocked hat, his long grey trench coat, not scruffy, but modest, and he always wears the uniform of the chasseur of the guard, the light cavalry of the guard, actually because it resembled most the uniform of his old artillery regiment. He's a very modest person in that respect. He doesn't need to dress up. He's Napoleon. He's got his trademark image and his white horse. Have you made any discoveries along the way that you think have eluded previous accounts? Yes, eluded to a certain extent. More illum I can illuminate things, I think. Well, the correspondence illuminates things for me. Give me an example. You can see in 1809, 
and 1810, how he's psyching himself up to divorce Josephine. You can trace it day by day in the letters he's writing to her, creating a smokescreen when he's coming back from Vienna that it's going to be OK. And yet you can also see the tortured letters he's writing to everybody else. Uh, and it really throws light on the process behind the mind. The other one I alluded to earlier is his correspondence with Joseph when things are going really badly for Joseph in Spain. And it's the day-to-day things. Now, cheer up. Chin up, bold boy. Don't you worry. You'll be a great king. We'll be, we're right behind you. Everybody's behind you. You'll be great. You, know, you can trace those very personal things. And we'll be digging a bit more into the legend and the legend building of Boney as we go along. Now Boney's away from his war and fighting. He has gone to a place where there's not candlelight him. He may sit there and dwell On the glories he has seen Oh, while forlorn he will mourn On the Isle of St Helena Well, we all know that Napoleon died in exile on St Helena in 1821, but what if he didn't? The idea that he swapped identities and escaped is the premise for Napoleon Disrobed, a play currently being staged by the company Told by an Idiot at the Arcola Theatre in East London. It stars Paul Hunter and Aisha Antoine, and Catherine Hunter is the play's director. Catherine, it's based on a novella, The Death of Napoleon, by Simon Lees. And what was it that appealed to you about the idea of the emperor being in disguise? I think immediately it was... An outrageous premise. I mean, not for an instant did we take it seriously as a historical proposition because the tone of Lisa's novel is it, it's quite clearly playful. It starts, as he bore a vague resemblance to the emperor, the sailors on board the Hermann Augustus Stoffer had nicknamed him Napoleon. And so, for convenience, that is what we shall call him. Besides... He was Napoleon. So, I mean, (laughs) I think you get there that this is a a playful pretext. And then what appealed was that it's quite elusive. You think you know where you're going. Basically, he escapes from St. Helena, setting up a double in his place, boards a ship um, as a cabin boy, finally arrives in Paris to discover the faithful who are left mourning the, the death of Napoleon, so his double has died. And he takes up with the widow of of one of the faithful and becomes a greengrocer. I mean, we have been quite free with fact and time in our production. But yes, I don't led... think they had key cards for hotel rooms. <laughs> in, no, but in I, I suppose century. we start very free and then that allowed us to go anywhere, really. But always led by Lisa's uh, inscription at the beginning, which I'll quickly read. What a pity to see a mind as great as Napoleon's, devoted to trivial things such as empires, historic events, the thundering of cannons and of men. He believed in glory and posterity in Caesar, nations in turmoil and other trifles absorbed all his attention. How could he fail to see that what really mattered was something else entirely? That's Paul Valéry Mauvais' Pensée et autres. So that's what led us really. What is this something else entirely? Are you what you do or how you love? And what aspects of the historical figure of Napoleon that Michael outlined for us a bit earlier did Paul Hunter draw on to create this <laughs> character? He's very human, he's very sympathetic, he's, he's frankly a bit chaotic at times and then sometimes you see this strategic zeal and focus. The human comes very much to the fore because he's robbed of his emperor's clothes and nobody knows who he is yes he's incognito so he's so frustrated in this uh, you know not to be doing his military strategies and everything that he puts all his skill into reinventing the melon business so we embrace the kind of genius aspect in an insane sort of way (laughs) the belief that he had escaped how widely held was it? I mean, Michael, you might like to just chip in on this. It was this uh, sort of widely indulged idea. There's a funny thing about this period between 1815 and when he dies in 1821. There's no news coming out of St Helena except to the security services until 1817. And even after that, that's when the first memoir appears. 
And people, friend and foe alike, be it Stendhal, who is great, uh, uh, Norman de Montbreton, his great geographers, people like Chateaubriand, who have the knife in him, they're all writing about him as if he were already dead. Which I suppose was the point of putting him there. It was. It was an extraordinary life and it came to an extraordinary end. You know, we've never had anyone like this before in the world. What on earth do we do with him? We put him on another island he can't escape from. And so obviously rumours are going to build up about it. Um, you know, he's got to America, something like that. You know, that's the most current one. But the real thing is people are already, before he's dead, before they even know he's ill, or myth-making about him already, I think. It's a remarkable literary genre, and it embraces almost everyone in Europe. Goethe, who he met a couple of times, they had a very interesting relationship. I mean, Goethe's writing about him as if he's dead. Well, there is a wonderful scene where he tries to intimate to this ex-sergeant that he's he is Napoleon. He, uh, the doctor takes him to an asylum, a sort of secret garden. Da, da, da. Anyway, it's finally revealed out come 40 people dressed in strange paper hats who all believe they're Napoleon. So at that point in the book, you think, well, is he one of them? Or, you know, is he the real Napoleon? And what is it about Napoleon that we aspire to admire? Laura O'Brien, we're going to come to you shortly to talk about Napoleon impersonation in a bit more detail. But is this artistic licence, or were there really substantial numbers of, of people who believed that they were Napoleon or at least could try to pass themselves off as the real thing? Well, I think, you know, there is this sort of slightly cheesy slogan that all madmen think they're Napoleon. And I think this was a real phenomenon. I think there's a, a French historian called Laure Murat who has done a lot of work on psychiatry in the post-revolutionary era. And her book is called The Man Who Thought He Was Napoleon. And what she shows is that there were peaks and troughs of people with monomaniacal conditions in Parisian asylums who claim that they were Napoleon. They also tie in with political and Napoleonic commemorative events. So, for example, Mm. There is a peak around the time of the return of the body in 1840. Esquiro, who is the psychiatrist in the National Asylum at Charenton, notes that, you know, we have created this situation where we're going to create cases of insanity because of the image being so prevalent. Laura and Catherine, thank you both very much. And Napoleon Disrobed is at the Arcola Theatre in London until the 10th of March and then on tour to Birmingham and Scarborough. But Paul Hunter's portrayal of Le Petit Caporal is just one of many stretching back to the early 19th century. I have come back! I have come back only to make France happy! Rod Steiger there, confidently donning the bicorn and thrusting his right hand into his waistcoat in Sergei Bondarchuk's 1970 film Waterloo. Laura O'Brien lectures in modern European history at Northumbria University. We've just heard from her. She's been researching the many iterations of Bonaparte on stage and screen, and she's on the line from Newcastle. We've talked a little bit about what might drive enthusiasm for imitating Napoleon or playing him, but when does it really get going? Well, what's interesting is that there are actually stage portrayals of him right from the very beginning. We can see that there are performances, these sort of military tableau stagings of his adventures in Italy. Same time as you have that that wonderful Gros portrait of him at the Bridge of Arcole, you get that being acted out on the Parisian stage as well. Napoleon bans performances of himself when he becomes emperor. He doesn't like to see doubles being him, if there is only one. Although, you know, we can talk a bit more about this idea of fake versus real. But it's really after 1830 when there is a revolution in France. Louis Philippe, uh, an Orleanist king, comes to power. He is keen to reconcile the various political traditions and historical traditions in post-revolutionary France to exploit the popularity of the Napoleonic legend, which had been a kind of a um, a seditious legend and a seditious form of, of belief throughout the 1820s during the Restoration. And in 1830-31, there are many, many performances that explode onto the Parisian stage. Um, and you get to a point where all the sort of Parisian boulevard theatres, the popular ones, have to have their own Napoleon. They have a resident Napoleon performer. And they have people who play Napoleon pretty much all their lives and don't, don't want to play anything else, which I would imagine would be the sort of actor Catherine would despair of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only taking the part if it's got Napoleon in it. Totally. Um, 
you know, you have certain people, so there's Gobert in the 1830s who becomes so typecast that he cannot do anything else. Ironically, rather like the the Napoleon in uh, Napoleon Disrobed, he has to go into a different business. So he becomes temporarily a, he runs a a lemonade shop in Paris or sort of a refreshment shop in Paris. And then he goes back to being Napoleon because he can't do anything else. I've got to ask an obvious question. Are they all or mainly French? I predominantly work on the French ones. You do get English ones. There's a famous English one in the 19th century called Edward Gomersol, who is recruited I think in a pub in Covent Garden, just because he looks like Napoleon. That's literally the only reason someone walked up to him and said, you look like Napoleon, do you want to be in a play? And he sort of becomes part of this phenomenon of Waterloo reenactments and staging performances, stage performances as well in the British, sort of Britain and Ireland in the 19th century. In France, it occupies a different role um, for the actor. It comes with a certain type of responsibility and a certain type of pressure, I think, as well, in terms of what they're doing with the performance. Where you do have to be careful um, is with the Napoleonic veterans and the people mm. who knew him. Yeah. Uh, but there's also a huge gap, you know, to take a step back from where Laura's taking us. Between 1815 and 1830, you could not mention Napoleon. You could not put on a play about him. You could not display any imperial insignia for obvious reasons. Mm. And then after this 15 years of suppression suddenly the July monarchy decides it's all all right and it happens and there has been a bit of a generational gap develop Mm. and a lot of the people if we're talking about people grumbling about impersonators a lot of the people who were closest to Napoleon withdrew into complete silence I don't talk to the press the marshals who knew him best his ex-wife Hortense his adopted daughter to him he was very close we don't Mm. no no you know we don't we don't talk to you, we don't get mixed up in this, they ignored it. But where you had to be careful in many ways was with the the, the veterans of the Grande Armée, the people they called the Grognards. They could be very touchy Mm. about the representation of their boss, Mm. but they were thinning out a bit, Mm. you know. uh, And it is, suddenly there's this explosion in 1830. I mean, there was an American historian, David Pinckney, who did a massive analysis of the Revolution of 1830, and Vive Napoleon was the second largest battle cry in the barricades mm. in Paris. Mm. And, and there is strong competition, isn't there, for things like who is going to get the, you know, the big reenactments, Laura? I mean, if yes. you, how on earth did they go about? I mean, do you audition? Or are you, uh, are you simply tapped on on the shoulder? I mean, what is the route to getting one of the really big gigs, big well, castings? I've, I think uh, just before I um, talk about that, I just want to pick up on Michael's point about the Grognard and their sort of very specific demands for what a Napoleon looks like. They all said they knew him. Not all of them did. But there is an incident in 1844 where a Napoleon appears on stage in Paris who is drunk and the crowd riots and Mm -hmm. sort of tries to trash the theatre and they have to ban the play. Ironically, it was a fundraising play to try to buy some Napoleonic manuscripts that were coming up for auction in London. But once they saw him, they went mad. They said, this is not what you do. This is offensive to the emperor. And they went mad. In terms of securing the part, I think for a lot of the early ones in the 1830s, 40s, it is about physical resemblance as much as anything else. As the sort of the 19th century goes on and I think there are changes in theatre and in dramatic techniques that you know becomes more of a focus on the acting acting as a technique I suppose I think the actors become more cognizant of the desire to play the role and to to take it on there are all sorts of anecdotes that surround the performance of Albert Giudone in Gonce's 1927 epic Mm -hmm. um, which I still think is the best Napoleon there's ever been, to be perfectly honest. Oh well, you, um, you've thrown down a challenge there. I think we've got to probably <laughs> throw that one out round the table. Who, who was the who was the best Napoleon there's ever been? I would have to agree with Laura. I think the best Napoleon who could ever have been was Al Pacino in his younger days. <gasps> oh, uh, that, 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 that stunned the, the crowd here in the studio. Well, Al I, would, I would turn the question oh, around and say the best Napoleon there could ever have been might have been Talma, the French tragedian, oh. because um, he's the actor that Napoleon is mm. directly admiring and getting a lot of his own stagecraft from. Mm. So we think mm. about people impersonating Napoleon. There's also the extent to which Napoleon is someone so conscious yes. of the theatrical in what he's doing himself. And of course, he loves going to the theatre. Yes, he does. I think the hardest thing for an actor would have been this. Everyone who knew Napoleon, ever met him, love him, hate him, always said, il avait un regard. He had a look, Mm -hmm. his eyes. 
And when you look at what he told his court painters, and he's very courageous, he says, you know, I'm, I'm getting on. You, know, you, you can paint me fat, you can paint me podgy, you can paint me tired, but you have to paint my eyes as you find them. And they're bright, they're piercing, he had a look. And I think it must have been very difficult to find an actor who could do that because it, it was the one thing everybody knew about him. You're listening to Free Thinking with me and McElvoy. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, we have a wealth of programmes in our archive, including interviews with prominent French thinkers and writers, including Leila Slimani, Laurent Pinet and Alain Flinkelkraut. All available if you go to the website or you can download us as your Arts and Ideas podcast and do tweet us at BBC Free Thinking. He was as valiant a Corsican as ever stood on Europe's land. I'm inclined to sing his praises, so ennobled was his heart. For in every battle manfully he strove to gain the victory. Frank Hart singing Napoleon Bonaparte there. Oscar Cox Jensen teaches history at Queen Mary University in London. He's discovered that popular songs like this one from the 19th century are a valuable source for revealing how Napoleon was viewed on this side of the channel. And he's explored that in detail in his book, Napoleon and British Song, 1797 to 1822. Oscar, that song sounds very pro Bonaparte, but there were also chamber pots decorated with his face and caricatures from the time, <laughs> which don't seem uh, quite so <laughs> flattering and indeed seem to suggest that, that he's widely reviled in, in Britain. Is that balance reflected in the songs? I think that balance is very much reflected and weirdly this is one of those historical questions where you normally want to say, oh, there's a lot of nuance so you can break this down in a hundred ways. This becomes quite binary, I think, the more you look at it. Um, the view we have today in Britain of Napoleon is so much this caricature, is the little man... I was listening to the new series of Just a Minute on a sister station this morning, and straight away Napoleon <laughs> is a question, and Jenny Eclair comes in with, oh, this tiny little guy, you know, big fighter, yeah. This is the story that's won today, and it's the story in songs in Britain that are put out, surprise, surprise, by the British authorities. And this really happens from 1803, when... Britain is again at war with France and Napoleon looks like he might be invading and there's this huge propaganda campaign against him. And this is the first really big, huge mixed media campaign and it's in caricature, as you say. I mean, we think of pictures of Napoleon in this country, we think of the Crookshanks, the Gilrays, it's all the big hat, the mm. little person. The smaller they make him, the bigger they make his hat, you know, and this is reflected in... <laughs> man eaten by hat. Yes. Man eaten by hat is what happens to him and it's the same thing in the in the songs there, the songs that are really getting at him. There's this one to the tune of the Bold Dragoon which has a chorus about his long sword, saddle, bridle, and the whole point is that he's a tiny man with a great big sword <laughs> and you kind of know what they're suggesting there. This is a person who is overcompensating in the worst possible way for personal deficiencies. I, I think you, you, you shortchanged us on that rather marvellous voice that you have. So feel free to break into song at any point. But the songs that you studied, were they all composed during his lifetime? If they're during the lifetime, it's very easy to get a date on a song because it's normally quite topical. It's talking about something that happens. But then this is why I've stupidly put 1822 on the title of my book because that's a gesture to the time after his death. And as Michael says, you know, is he dead before he's dead? But there are all of these songs that are effectively after he's in exile, and they have a very different view of him. But I don't want to say it's just about before and after he goes into exile and afterwards people are very sympathetic, because I think the story is really songs composed by the people who care about Napoleon from the start. They're very interested in him as a man, and they're far more even-handed especially in Ireland, especially from the north mm. of England. These are songs that are really mm. interested in him. Mm. Uh, I'm obviously angling for another burst here, but have you got a, a favourite couplet or one that you think really sort of nails your character? Well, weirdly, my favourite is the one you started out with, with Frank Hart and Donald Lummy, Isle of St Helena. But another positive one is literally the first song composed after Waterloo. It's by a, an English soldier who's lying in a hospital in Brussels, and he's working up the first sort of narrative song of the battle. And what's now become the chorus of that song, it's not evangelising for anything, it's just sympathising. And it's a sort of the chorus is, What a sad heart had poor Boney to take up instead of a crown. A canter from Brussels to Paris, lamenting the 18th of June. So it's not trying to get across any particular message in pro or against him, but it's really seeing 
he's poor bony, he's got a sad heart, he's lost. And the rest of the song is quite an angry song about the fact that all this person's friends have died in this battle, people are injured, and the people back home, they've got no idea what war is really like. And this is very much the view from a lot of Britons who are thinking about this. They don't blame Napoleon for the fighting because this is something that happens. They blame the British state, the people who've taken their men, they press gang them into the navy, they've taken them from the jails and sent them off to war. And those people have suffered out there. They've come back with, with, you know, with missing limbs. And they don't blame Napoleon. They blame, they blame the British state for that. And so Napoleon, he's a victim too. He's suffered. And what about this idea of, of Bernie as a, a figure of fun? You, know, you, you mentioned the, the, the hat, hat devouring, the sort of great legend of, of his deeds and his achievement. But are there songs which are just well, sort of downright rude, really, about him? <laughs> there, there are downright rude songs, and a lot of them come with his second marriage to, to Marie Louise of Austria. I mean, Napoleon disrobed. That idea there, that comes along right at the time. They think, you can't deal with this person on the battlefield. Let's say you're the, you're the British, you're trying to concoct a, a way to get at him. You, you have to imagine him in his nightshirt. And so he's, he's seen as impotent. Then when it turns out he is going to have a son, which is all he wants, they imagine it's not his baby. They do that sort of thing. And of course, being British, they love a good pun. There are two songs which have... Um, uh, I'm braced um, already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to sing them because we, sadly we don't have the tunes, but it's all about bony part. There's a Birmingham songwriter in 1803 called Collins and, and he makes this thing about, he does a terrible cod French accent which I'm really not sure I should replicate in present company but he sort of um, says for he say by God that bony part is von great sheep or calf it's like he's, he's, and this is taken up a few years later by a songwriter Charles Stephen the Younger who has this amazing long song about why the British shouldn't be scared of Napoleon okay so this will take a few seconds but he constructs this narrative song where there's a country inn and it's haunted by this fearful vision every night. And this inn is meant to represent the British state. It's at a time when Napoleon's winning everything, between 1805 and 1810, as Michael says. And every night this vision of a scrag of mutton appears in the fireplace of the inn <laughs> in a boiling pot, a scrag of mutton. Then one day a scholar comes along to the inn. That scholar is called John Bull. And he says, I know what I'm going to do with a scrag of mutton. And he sets a fire in the fireplace and boils up the scrag of mutton. And he says, don't be afraid of a scrag of mutton, for a scrag is but a small bony part. And that, <laughs> is, that is the pun at the end of a very long shaggy dog story. <laughs> <laughs> but we heard a, a clip earlier from the 1970 film Waterloo, and I think there's a scene in that which features British soldiers singing Bony was a, a oh, yes. warrior. <laughs> is that an authentic song for, from the period, or, or is that sort of grafted on afterwards? It's an authentic song from a period. Don't get me wrong, I love that film a lot. And it's got so the score composed by Nina Rota is, is a fabulous one, I think, very stirring. That particular one is um, great license. Firstly, why are the British soldiers singing this before the battle? Secondly, <laughs> this is a shanty. It is a work song for, um, I think it's a capstan shanty, but someone's going to write in about that. Anyway, it's only to be done on board ship to perform a task. More importantly, it's a life story of Napoleon that includes his death. It's not composed until the 1820s <laughs> and 30s. And it's French, English and American sailors who come up with this song a generation later. So yeah, a bit naughty to put that one in there. He, he travels. Well, we've heard plenty about the British view of Napoleon. How is he regarded in 21st century France? Nabila Ramdani is a French journalist based here in London. She's been sitting patiently uh, listening to all of this. Nabila, growing up in France, how was Napoleon presented to you? You remember your first encounters with the story? Well, I, I would say, you know, it's almost 200 years since Napoleon died and I would contend that he remains the most influential and indeed best-known Frenchman in modern history and also a unifying figure. Uh, some would go for uh, Charles de Gaulle, but as so much that is associated with de Gaulle, I think much of this is myth and indeed centred on wartime capitulation and indeed humiliation. Napoleon, in contrast, mainly represents... Uh, imperial glory, uh, domestic advancement, uh, radical change and the power of the individual. And yes, defeat at the Battle of Waterloo is a big part of his legacy, but it was a close-run thing and anti-bony British propaganda hasn't diminished his legacy. Do you think he was seen as a, a unifying figure all the time that you were learning about? Or, you know, are you aware of sort of a switch between that view of Napoleon as a sort of conqueror and a unifier and that interesting tension when we look at him? 
Well, I think the reason Napoleon is a unifying figure is because he embodied French greatness and, and martial glory. I mean, he built imperial France and he represented and indeed propagated uh, French civilization. And in that respect, he was a, a national hero. He was a staunch nationalist. And all those factors did unify, and to a certain extent, they still unify uh, modern France. I mean, saying a historical figure is made up of contradiction is a bit yes. of a cliche, but yes. uh, Napoleon certainly was full of contradictions. Uh, he came to power as a great defender of the 1789 revolution, someone who could defeat archaic monarchies and bring France into the modern world of liberté, égalité, fraternité, and a host of other ideals which make up republican uh, democracies. Domestically, Napoleon has left his legacy all over France. He was a liberal reformer. He introduced the Napoleonic Code, which has influenced the legal systems of more than 70 countries around the world. And he was something that the French actually love, and Michael used the word uh, earlier on, he was a rational administrator. He ended banditry in the countryside, he, as well as feudalism, and he's promoted science and, and indeed the arts. Just reminded me, I think it was Oscar who threw up the word harlequin earlier. Yeah. I think you need to explain that one. I want to pay a slight debt there to David Taylor at Warwick, who this is really his thing. But this comes back to the theatre. Um, the harlequin in theatre of the time is this transformative figure who, with his magic bat, can shift the scene entirely. And this happens in British caricature, this idea that like, all the world's a stage and Napoleon on it, especially when he comes back from exile, he is this harlequin who can change the whole scene of Europe but I think you can take that as a reflection on his domestic potential as well because if there's one thing Napoleon does he mixes things up he sets the stage. But just Nabila coming back to you that that view of Napoleon that you laid out there overwhelmingly positive but didn't it change with the rise of European dictators and that terrible history of the mid-20th century when the idea of the powerful all-sweeping conqueror you know just has such a nasty aftertone in, in, in France and beyond. Well, indeed, I mean, of course, Napoleon became an emperor as well, and he's used his massive talent uh, as a soldier to do what despots have always tried to do, which is to conquer the world. And he had a series of epic battles named after him, uh, the Napoleonic Wars, and he had an immense influence on the development uh, uh, of Europe. However, a lot of his legacy expected people to suspend reality. And this is especially so during the Second World War when people started to see what Napoleonic figures really represent. Mm. And I would have to say that Adolf Hitler was hugely influenced by mm. Napoleon. Mm. He visited Paris in the early days of the Second World War and, and he toured the city like a wonderstruck schoolboy. And he was especially keen, keen to, to visit Napoleon's incredible tomb uh, at the Invalides. And just the other day, I saw some amazing black and white pictures of, of him doffing his cap to the tomb while his Nazi generals, who were all standing around him, looked quite astonished. And he's obviously thinking about how he can deploy that. You know, it, indeed. I mean, Hitler to wanted to be a, a Napoleon. Names. And yeah. it's this kind of thought that has gradually helped to wear down uh, the Napoleon myth in modern France. I'm very interested in how more diverse France ethnically, racially, deals with Napoleon. I think you have French-Algerian background, am I right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that the view of Napoleon has changed as France has changed after colonialism? I mean, he was, of course, very strongly associated with colonialism. He wanted to expand France, you know, to other parts of, of, of the world, and, and, and he wanted to dominate Europe as well. He wanted to centre France to become the centre of Europe and, and indeed the world to a certain extent. And you only have to look at Paris to see this huge uh, legacy. All periods of history are covered in Paris, uh, but it's primarily a magnificent modern imperial city built to the glories of an imperial republic. Michael? There are two points that have struck me. Obviously, we know about Hitler's admiration for Napoleon, but the irony is that Napoleon's great hero was Frederick the Great. And when Napoleon defeats the Prussians, after he's crushed them, he goes to Frederick's tomb at Potsdam. Mm. And Frederick the Great was one of the most enlightened, rational rulers of the 18th century. He was regarded not just as a great commander, but as a beacon of enlightenment. Mm. Napoleon spent a long time at that tomb thinking. The other interesting thing is Napoleon... I think we've got to get away from the myth that Napoleon was popular in France in his own times. The majority of the French peasantry 
hated him. They resented him. They were Catholic. He trampled over his agreement with the church. He conscripted their sons. The, the French peasantry had a word for conscription. They called it the blood tax. And in the early years, immediately after his death, he's only really loved by the men who served him, as we've been talking about. The myth of the great redeemer, the great Frenchman, doesn't come till that generation have faded. Oscar. Yeah, there's something slightly unpleasant here to us today about thinking about a series of great male war leaders going to each other's tombs and thinking grand thoughts on it. And if we really think through Napoleon's colonial legacy, a man reintroducing slavery, his brutal suppression of the Haitian fight for independence, really, and... Even just the idea of him as genius, I think post-Hitler in particular, this is an uncomfortable view. The British in the 1940s, they have a series of productions which are all comparing Hitler and Napoleon, mostly saying, we've done this once before, we can do it again. I went to see Napoleon Disrobe last week, and this is what I was really thinking. Catherine, there you seem to have made the decision to take away the genuine genius of the incredibly cold, rational, strategic person and replace it with something far more sympathetic. I feel... There's something about Napoleon as individual genius that is quite off-putting these days because it's associated with all of those rather more unsavoury things. And Nabila, how stable do you think we'll find his reputation will be? Well, as I was saying, he's, you know, he, he was a man of great uh, contradictions. And of course, nowadays, he's often described as a cruel, uh, racist dictator. But I think the reputation of all historical figures are revised negatively uh, today. And in the end, he was a man of, of contradictions who was rightly praised for achieving greatness, but also rightly admonished for his excesses. And I have to say that the, his legacy was um, largely tainted uh, at the hands of the British. British, as uh, Oscar was uh, explaining, not only because he suffered a cataclysmic uh, defeat at Waterloo, but also the British insisted on capturing him on, and sticking him on, on a distant island where he eventually died, of course. But even after that, the British would not hand his body back for 20 years. And that's because they feared him. They really feared its nationalistic symbolism. And ever since, the British have continued to do a very good job at portraying him as an almost comic little man who was finally br brought to heel by the Anglo-Saxons in the most humiliating manner possible. I think this is something that I've found from teaching Napoleon as an Irish person in Britain is that, I mean, I'm, you know, those wonderful Frank Hart songs, we have a completely different perspective. He is the most love-hate figure I think I've ever seen in a country. You go into a bookshop, as I point out to my students, you will always get books on Napoleon, some of which are by Michael, which is great. Um, and, you know, you might not get a book on the French Revolution, but there's plenty of books about Napoleon because they have this, there's a strange fascination. It's like mm. you can't look away from him. And I'm, I'm not sure why that is, why they can't wrest themselves away, why the British mindset necessarily can't wrest itself away from the image of bad bony. Michael, as, uh, as someone who at least in part lives from Napoleon. Well, of course, I grew up under Napoleon's nose in Belfast myself. And I'll finish with what Goethe said about Napoleon. He said, the more you try to denigrate him, the smaller you make yourself, you'll always come off worst. Many thanks to all my guests on our Napoleonic quest. Michael Brewer's book, Napoleon, the Spirit of the Age, is published in March. Napoleon Disrobed is at the Arcola Theatre in London till the 10th of March. And tomorrow, Stephen Pinker explains to Philip Dodd why we should ignore the newspaper headlines and be more optimistic. But until then, it's goodbye from me and my permanently chirpy producer, Torquil McLeod.